Hi everybody, this is Kate Haley with Glazers here in Seattle, Washington. It's Friday, I hope everybody's having a great day and hopefully you have some fun plans for the weekend. I don't actually have anything planned, so I'm trying to figure out where I can go out and take some photos, hopefully. Um, before we get started today with our presentation, we have a couple of awesome folks from Sigma on the line, and we're going to talk about creating photo essays. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanna share an update about our other upcoming events. I think I mentioned this last week when we did an event, or earlier this week, that um, PhotoFest is happening this year. Um, as you know, hopefully you know, uh, we do PhotoFest every year in the summer. It's our big, big, big sale of the year. Um, and those dates are June 10th. The awesome thing is we will have a lot of great programming over those four days, a bunch of live presentations with ambassadors, including a Sigma ambassador named Meg Lokes. Um, so looking forward to that. Along with that programming, we're also going to have at least one, maybe three or four photo walks that will be in-person events. But all the programming outside of those will be live on YouTube, just like we're doing right now. If you go to our website, go to the events page and check out the Glazers Photo Fest site. It's our 12th year doing this event. We're super excited and Woo! really stoked for uh, that event to take place. So um, check it out on our events page. All right, so what are we doing today? Today we have two awesome gentlemen from Sigma on the line. One is Mike Hill. Say hi, Mike. <laughs> hi, everyone. Hi, nice um, to meet you. And Mike works with Sigma. Mike, what part of the country are you in? I'm in the Southwest. I'm based out of Las Vegas. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Now, this is the first time Mike's done a presentation with us, um, and he's going to lead the presentation on creating photo essays. But before we start that, I also want to let you guys know we do have Aaron uh, from Sigma on the line as well. And many of you may know Aaron already because he's been our rep in the Pacific Northwest for at least a couple of years now, I'm pretty sure. Is that right, Aaron? That's right, Kate. Yeah, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> I think I was, I, you know, time flies and like 2020 yeah. was like not a real year, you know, so it's hard to know exactly how long. But you might recognize Aaron because he's been in store for previous events like PhotoFest, anniversary sales, and other photo walks that we've done here in the city. And Aaron's also led quite a few presentations with us online in this format over the past year. So um, what you'll see is during the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to post those in the chat on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook. Both Aaron and I will be um, moderating those and we might answer some of your questions in the actual chat. And we might do a little bit of Q&A with Mike as we go through the presentation. So don't be shy with your questions. You know, we love to see your questions and we also would love to know maybe where you're tuning in from. And do you already own a Sigma lens? Let us know. All right, so with all of that said, um, let's go back over to Mike. And Mike, um, let's kick off your presentation. All right, yeah, thank you, Kate. And thank you, Glazers. So today we're gonna to be talking about photo essays and really, let me just get this clicking here. Let's start, here we go. Let's try that again. With photo essays, we're gonna talk about how to take a variety of images and create a story. So for me, I've always liked photo essays. I remember my uh, grandmother would have these, these photo albums where you are seeing these four photos. And in a way, that's like the first photo essay. You know, you'd see a two page spread and how do you put the grandkids in or how do you put some life event in there that tells a story? And um, for me, I, I grew up shooting a lot of skateboarding and BMX. I've been a photographer for about 30 years. And I would say that as you're going through life, just think about sometimes I, recently I found a bunch of photos from high school and um, this is like 1990. So these you're in the moment you're shooting something you can go back on things and find out that's a photo essay and some of the things you think don't look that special at the moment that you see later you're like oh my god i couldn't couldn't recreate some of these hairstyles so you have these you have these i would say try to be in the now and shoot these things and sometimes they evolve over time or you go back way down the line and see something that works out as a photo essay um, and I, again, I added a little bit about me in the intro of this. Uh, I, I shot a lot of punk rock shows. And this is again in the 90s. You're seeing a lot of cross process. 
Now I'm taking a, a, a digital camera and shooting macro photos of negatives and slides and finding out here's a photo essay just on one uh, place called the Huntridge, which is where a lot of shows happen and now is tear, torn down and is recently being rebuilt. So you find they have even use and interest uh, later on down the line. And one of the most common things I like to shoot is artists at work. With, for, the reason I like that is because I'm an artist as well, but I love trying to capture somebody that is doing something they really care about and enjoy. Because as you're doing photography, which you hopefully care about and enjoy also, you're, you're kind of vibing off what they're doing. So, you know, and it also allows them to be very natural in their environment. So for me, um, that's something, and it's something I, I highly recommend. If there's something you really are interested in, and maybe you don't do it, maybe it's music, maybe it's arts, it's great to try to capture someone doing that because in a way you're creating a collection of photos, a photo essay of sorts that will tell that story. And I think as we do photo essays, or as we try to shoot photo essays, we're, we're hoping that we can get one photo that tells it all but often we get a, a variety of photos. So it's almost like thinking of a collage or a storyboard. So this is a good thought as you're creating. Create images that tell a story and are meaningful to the viewer, subject, and photographer. And I think in most, most things, uh, if you try to have the part meaningful, you're off on the right foot, yeah, especially with photography or anything you do. Uh, and if you can feel it's meaningful, then all the better, right? And hopefully you can somehow illustrate that to the viewer. And if whoever you're photographing is saying, oh, wow, I love that. That's like the trifecta. So back to our first image here. Uh, so this one was really trying to indicate how this is an event. So how can you, if you've taken a bunch of photos, you've got back to your Lightroom, and you're editing them, try to create your first image as something the most, very impactful that tells a story, but leaves a little bit of curiosity and mystery. So this was actually at a rock climbing event in Park City, Utah. It's called Psycho Block. And it is these climbers climb 55 feet up above this Olympic pool. And first one up wins. And if you fall, you fall right down into this water. So this, this could be considered not just in a uh, photo essay, but also an event photography type of thing. So ha as you're at an event, you, know, you start with something like, here's a great opener, here's something that illustrates a sense of place, a sense of who's there, what's happening, can we capture it in one. Oftentimes a wide angle lens, even a 35 millimeter, which isn't super wide, can capture a lot of that. As you're going, try to look at what it is what it is that I'm capturing in the camera, and try to be hypercritical. Have fun while you're shooting, but go. Am I getting just the same thing over and over? When I get back, am I going to just have a hundred rock wall photos with with a rock climber? So you can see in these uh, people preparing, uh, training, getting ready. Uh, this one on the bottom right is a competitor about to go up the wall. And what's great about the 35 millimeter 1.4 is it allows you to shoot in very low light. So that is, a, that is ideal when you don't want to use a flash, you've got good ambient light, maybe you kick the ISO up just a little bit and you know what you're trying to, you're, you're trying to shoot a very tight little detail. Maybe it's the person, it's the hands. So fast prime lenses, very useful in photographing any photo essay. And I will be taking questions, criticisms, ideas, all the way through this. You could just pop at me anytime too. This is actually a, an artist based out of the Pacific Northwest, represent, he's out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, his name is Greg Higgins, Greg Higgins Art, if you wanna check him out. But um, capturing this artist at work in a studio, um, again, People get more relaxed if you can say, just do your thing. So start, so here he's using something called a mall stick and that keeps your hands steady as you're painting. So as, we, as we're working through a space, and again, a, I, I should mention, most of the time my, my lens of choice is a 35 millimeter because it is the closest to your, your vision minus peripheral vision. With, and it is a little bit wide, but it's not so wide as distorting things. 
And it's also nice enough that it can be a portrait lens of sorts, not a lot of distortion on the face. It's just a great all around lens. And because it's the prime, you can have 1.4 versus 1.4 when you need it, you can open it up wide to get all the light you need. Sometimes a 24 to 72 way. Hey, Mike. It will do the trick, but it helps to have that fast aperture. Hey, Mike. Yes. Your uh, audio is getting a little bit choppy. We we misunderstood some of what you just said. I'm wondering okay. um, if if we, it, would you be okay? It's good now. Um, we might just gotcha. want to keep an eye on it because maybe we, I don't know how your bandwidth is, but maybe we want to kill your video for a little bit to okay. free up space. Let Devin, me, uh, should we do that? Um, if, if it becomes an issue, I'll cut let's, the video. Okay, well, we let's keep going for now. Yeah. Um, thank, it just, we had you. that little hiccup, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm I'm actually using the, uh, the the microphone on the on the laptop, so I caught myself drifting back away from the the camera. So yeah, that might be what I was doing too. But, okay, um, we're good for now. We'll let you know okay. if we have more problems. So let's keep rolling. It. Okay. Uh, so so for the first shot, usually if you're working with someone, say you get an assignment, it's someone you don't know. In this case, I do know this person, but. The first job is to shoot this, photograph this person. You want to capture who they are and where they are, what they do. So you're trying to capture as many things as possible in one image. And then you're finding out how they do it and how can you illustrate that to your viewer. So obviously as an illustrator, you're, you're going to capture the tools and you're going to capture elements that might uh, inform form us who they are. I mean, this person shoots a, uh, does a lot of skateboard art, BMX art. So we're trying to tell that story slowly throughout these images. When you're shooting, think about detail shots. Think about, can I give, make shots that have negative space in them? And think of, you can think about rule of thirds. But with this, the idea is maybe that person will use this for, to put text on the far right-hand corner of this page. Or, um, something for a website or an announcement. So have some other options that aren't, are a little more esoteric, I guess you could say. And for me, I like to shoot a more formal shot. A lot of times you'll see uh, in an article, they'll just use maybe one shot like this, you know, Greg Higgins is an art illustrator, da, 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 da. And they just, you can't have a photo essay. So try to shoot that more formal shot after you've got everything dialed in. So you know your exposure, you can see what's working. You like your spot. Don't, I would recommend not starting with something where you're stumbling over yourself too much. That way, because it kind of sets the stage when you're, when you let them have a little bit of fun, they can relax, you can relax. So that's, that's, so shoot the more formal shot last. Usually the same thing at a wedding too. You know, the weddings are all nice and photojournalistic. And then it gets to that part with the formals, then it's just like a total nightmare, but you, <laughs> it just, you know, it just is always so stiff and it's the most work that there is in a wedding probably. And it's, it's the least interesting part here. This is a, uh, again, these people have uh, it's called Somersault Letterpress. They have a, a printing press. It does all old school Heidelberg lithographs and all these different things. So again, document them in, in their space, Having someone tell you what is interesting about what they do and pointing to it really will help you along. And in this one, I had to take a photo of two people. And with this, we're using two studio lights. We're using a key light and a fill light. And the most important part of that, again, is try, try to get your lighting right in the spot you want to shoot the people. Maybe have an assistant jump in there. And then the, the, the more difficult part becomes when you're shooting two people. Especially because you have to, if one of them is acting a little nervous, which one of these people were, you're shooting a ton of photos to try to relax them. And usually if you have one person that is easily relaxed and they look great, have them just lock in and then just keep shooting the other, the other person until they get more comfortable with it. Shooting a single person is a lot easier to edit than shooting two people, as many of you know out there. You'll be going, oh, I nailed it on this one. Oh, this one didn't work out with that person. So it's, 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 they both got to look good. Again, look for those details in the space. And again, we played with the idea of writing somersault in the letterpress uh, um, 
letters and it's a great idea. I think about stuff like this is maybe this could be a home page of a website. And I think it would be a pretty cool one for a printing press. So that's the idea too, is try to over deliver, maybe give the extra stuff. Hey, I want you to take a photo of us at our letterpress place. Okay, what else can I do? How can I make this more of a photo essay? As I said earlier with the Sigma 3514, uh, it was the first art lens in our Sigma Global Vision line in around 2012. And what that means is all of our lenses that are SGV can be updated, have firmware updated on the lens to work well with the camera you have now or the camera you have in a couple of years from now, because we'll be able to up firm, update firmware to play better with that camera you have. Um, ever since then, we have, we now currently have a uh, 435 millimeters. Let me see if I'm right about that. Yes, we have, we just announced a new 35 millimeter 1.4 DGDN, which is for the mirrorless cameras, and that is a full frame, uh, 35 millimeter. I highly recommend it. I'm just now checking out the samples, and we do a 35 millimeter f2 contemporary, and we do a 35 millimeter 1.2 for the mirrorless camera. Hey, Mike. Yes. Um, I'm. Could you stop and start your audio? It's still a little bit choppy on our end. We okay. did. Um, we did stop your video because it was. Got better. It got better once we did that, but we're just wondering if you could stop and restart your audio real quick, and let's see if that fixes that. Mute. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Yeah. Testing, one, two, three. How's that sounding, Devin? The good. Okay. How about... Um, since we're, let's just take a second. Let's take a quick uh, question. What do you think? Okay, go ahead. Oh, wait, where, did you step away? <laughs> <laughs> um, are you, uh, are you mixing any video and stills for these projects that you're doing, or is it all stills for you right now? It is all stills on this. I was actually going to try to grab a, uh, um, a microphone connector here if there was one, but that's what I was going to play. Yes, yeah, these are all stills on this. Yeah, no, let, just to the audio issue, that's, it does feel like it's a bandwidth issue, not necessarily your mic. The audio sounds good when it's coming in. It's just been a little bit choppy, and that's typically a bandwidth issue. That's why um, we're just trying to troubleshoot some of it. Um, yeah. So don't worry oh, about yeah. trying to find a mic. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah, to answer your question, I'll try to speak up if that helps. Uh, I'm a bit of a mumbler too, so I'm trying my best on that. But, uh, so mostly all this is stills. I'd like to have more video uh, as we go and I'm learning it, but really you bring up bandwidth. For me, it's been about computer power and space yeah. on editing video has been very, it's very interesting to do, but it takes a lot of more more computer power for sure. Right. So on. So it's all right to proceed on, on the audio so far. So far, we're good. Yeah, and 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 if and we may turn your video off again. We'll just we're gonna play it by ear and just do what we can to make sure we have the best uh, audio for everybody tuning in. So yeah, let's keep going. A lot of the, a lot of the participants are going. Turn it off. Turn it off. Or some are saying <laughs> actually. <"Turn it> off. <laughs> him on screen this guy's a tall drink of water i mean that's what i'm assuming is being said <laughs> well right now they're asking about lenses so which is appropriate for the conversation <laughs> perfect <laughs> well, the, get the 35 millimeter is get any one of the 35 millimeter lenses is, is one you'll see i would say too that i'm a big fan of looking of when you go out not to carry too many lenses and and Aaron could attest to this too that working at Sigma suddenly we have so many lenses at our disposal and it almost sometimes to me is a it slows things down if you have too many sometimes it's good to just go out and go I'm going to shoot only with an 85 or only with a 35 and just force myself into it it's a good exercise so for me one of my favorites is the 35 millimeter uh, this shot is of my two nephews uh, jumping down a hill in Oceanside, California, just being totally crazy as they do. Um, 
But again, try to capture that emotion. And as I was saying with trying one lens is move around. This is the same lens, the same space, but backing up a little bit, you get this cathedral look of the Fremont Street experience or coming out a little bit, it becomes this blue skies thing. Um, so bouncing around your instead of with a zoom, you don't have to do that. You're just zooming in and out. So if you are someone who doesn't want to walk back and forth too much, a zoom lens is a great thing. Of course, you don't get the fast aperture here. We're at F8. It really wouldn't have mattered. But I like to walk back and forth a little bit here and there. The you know, playing with the rule of thirds when you're when you're shooting, think about how you can have some balance in your photo while still telling a story. And then play with different types of contrast of colors, color harmonies and shapes in, in the images. Again, some of these are more just on tricks you can do to to help build a photo essay as you're shooting, because the idea when you're shooting a photo essay is really to try to shoot as many the same things different, you know, keep trying to try with the first thing that's obvious and to keep moving it around. This was not um, this is a selection of quick portraits of people that needed to be photographed at their work. So this was a small project of local businesses. And how do how can we photograph them in their space real quick just to represent them? All of them were very reserved and weren't interested in being photographed too much. So with you're kind of just finding out what do you do? Oh, I, I work with shoes or I work with toys or the other guy here at the bottom left, you know, it wasn't as, as interesting. So we found a, a something visual on the wall to play with. And at the top right, you can see someone that works with glass. So if you have something transparent, why not work with that backlight on it? So again, it's just when you get there, try to make it easy on the person you're photographing and also just try to mix it up. I, it's always a, a dance on how long you're, how much of their time you're taking. You got to kind of feel that out. Like, do I have I, is this person over it right now or do I have someone that's just down to go as far as we want to go with this, this photo? So um, this is, and does anybody have any questions right now? And No, we're good right now. We're, we're talking okay. about lenses a little bit in the chat room. Um, I'd but I'd say let's continue with the story part of what you're talking about and we can dive a little bit more into the gear in a bit. And, and, and this presentation may bounce around just as much as my, my thoughts do. So uh, with your, with the 3514, another great part of this is, is having a prime lens is usually a smaller lens, especially with some of the newer 35 we make, the 35 F2 or the 3514. For me, uh, this is on a DSLR before I went mirrorless. And when I wanted to carry something, obviously I didn't want to flash. I want to carry light and you want to have something that works in low light. So anything 1.4 or fast is going to do that. The one downside is that I brought this to the, the Roots concert. It was on a New Year's Eve, but I, I was very close to the front and I only brought a 35.14 and instantly, and we all know we've been there where you have a lens and you know you have the wrong lens in a way. You wish you had, you're like, damn, I wish I had the 14 to 24. You know, maybe that would have been better. I just didn't have it at the time, but the 30, so you have to make what you have work. So here's Questlove in the back and then Black Thought is, is the rapper up front. The best you could do is I'll focus in on the drummer and maybe show that there's an MC in the front, but I really wish I could have wide angled out on this. So you got to kind of make it work, I guess, is, is part of it. And as you're moving through that space again, say I've got the front row shots or whatever. I've got the guy singing. Let me move around. What are the fans doing? What is it like to be a fan in the crowd from the back or maybe from above that you see an angle of view or where's the action? Where's the energy? It's hard to capture energy with stills. Uh, unlike video, you can see all the people jumping around. So you're trying to show that with stills. And I think um, it's a good way to do that. Just moving around, see what works. I really like the top right kind of the crowd moving around and just being in there. This is a shot of a neighbor actually. And this was for, we did a, an event. It was for Adobe Creative Jam. And it was just 
the assignment was to, you had to illustrate a topic in 24 hours and the topic they gave you was uh, making something out of nothing. So they had videographers do this and uh, photographers do it. It's called Adobe Creative Jam if you ever want to check it out and it goes all over the country. But the idea here was uh, I shot a bunch of different things, my kids building stuff with recycled bottles or anything, the idea of making something out of nothing. And as I was sitting there, I heard him playing the violin. So I thought that is kind of music is sort of something out of nothing. And as I asked him, he said, well, I know how to do this, but when I'm really into it, it's almost like coming through me. So it's something out of nothing in a way. Um, but this was a really, it was noon, the light was behind him. So in this case, using a fill flash, and I could have probably got blue skies, but I chose to let it blow out. Uh, might not have been on flash on this one, actually. No, I might have just let it blow out. But um, exposing for the foreground, exposing for the subject, and then really just kind of capturing a bunch that lets you, let the viewer kind of feel what it is you were going for. Depth of field really helps with that a lot. So you see it uh, F2.2, you get that really shallow foreground and then even on his hair, it starts to kind of get uh, a little out of focus. So that's a really nice thing about shallow depth of field. The one thing is on this one at F2.2, both of his eyes are in focus very nicely. A lot of times if you're at 1.4, 1.8, you get one eye in focus. If it looks intentional, it's great. So a lot of times I try to turn people directly at you. So both eyes are in focus or you're definitely hitting this eye and not the back eye. The 35 millimeter also, this is for if you're, the topic might be for a, a local uh, artisanal foods. They make food uh, and they, and the idea was to capture how they do this and the people behind that. So this is for like, vice munchies and as you're shooting, again, start with someone doing what they, they love, which is the cooking part. Have them walk you through it and always have that beginner's mind where I don't know anything, which for me is very easy to go into right away. <laughs> but yeah, try to move around this space. And then for me, Artisanal Foods was the name of the location. So top left, capturing that information, it can inform the viewer and it can be useful to the client as well working uh, with culinary stuff again you're you start with hey throw the pizza up in the air work around it that way what else are you doing slicing dicing and then try to find angles that again can get have a different perspective we get the idea that he's pulling out a pizza f2.8 you're still getting a very sharp focus on the places that matter usually if you're hitting the eyes you're pretty good and a lot of the new cameras with uh, face and eye detection are about the greatest thing ever for me lately. Who out there is using face and eye detection? I want you to raise your, I want you to represent out there. I want you to raise a hand. I want you to smash that like and subscribe button over at Glazers. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so, <Very> good. <laughs> so the, 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 the uh, this smash is a it hard, yeah. Uh, <laughs> People don't smash it too hard. Don't smash it twice because no, you'll no, unsubscribe. No, no. Yeah. We want you subscribing and then you, uh, you don't smash it anymore. It was just a one time smash. Yeah, because if you so, smash it again, then you unsubscribe, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is uh, a, a one of the, uh, this is a, a gentleman in Phoenix that builds, rebuilds lenses and he's been doing this since. Uh, he used to do, do, uh, be a machinist in the Army, and since like the 60s, he started using all his machinery uh, equipment to fix older lenses and change mounts on them. He's showing me all his tools. You can tell he's not that into being, in, being photographed, but you just got to kind of encourage people along the way, I think. A lot of times, just like, no, no, that's great. Do your thing, and then when they're over it, then bring them back into camera, like smile for them, video. I think one of, um, I think it's a strength is to look like a total, just embarrass, the, just embarrass yourself to try to take a photo. I think, and when people are doing that, when people are laying on the ground, acting like maniacs, you see when you're shooting your kids or whatever it is, I usually think that's, you're on the right track because you're already outside of yourself and you're imagining 
what what will the photo look like afterwards? I didn't have to, I think if I would have done too much of that, he would probably kick me right out of there. But with certain, certain cases, it is the right people around, you could, you could do it. He wasn't up for no nonsense, but. Um, and this same idea, artists at work, how can, how can you photograph them? Um, this is the, the image we used for the, uh, the, the cover here, but um, this artist, Stephanie, she is, you're, you already know you 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 have a painter. You're gonna you're gonna do the typical stuff, and I you you kept, I caught the uh, ease. Um, what was that palette uh, was transparent. It's like oh that's great. And this thing in the background is actually wallpaper. So it's trying to crop out nonsense and trying to keep in something interesting would be the takeaway. Same this they're doing. She's doing woodblock printing, and I saw oh she's doing it on a mirror. Let's try to try to play with that idea. Maybe we can get a little mirror in there. Now these were kind of quick. Sometimes you'll do a shoot and you'll say, I'd love to do this one more time. I usually almost always do that with every, every photo shoot. I wish I could go back one more time and start from where I was at here because I was onto something. So just be aware of what you might be onto, what might be working because maybe you think you got it and you get back to the to Lightroom and you're like, oh man, I just missed the focus. So and then that moment's gone and you're likely not gonna go back and do it and all the things are gonna line up perfectly. But so we know to be very critical when we're in Lightroom on the edit and be very open when we're shooting because we wanna be fun while we're shooting. We don't wanna to be too uptight. But you have to, when you look on your camera back, just double check some things. Am I in autofocus? Am I missing focus? Like I'm at 1.4, am I actually getting the eyeball? Or am I getting her nose every time? Those are, those are some things that you, you just get so mad at yourself when you get home. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of people out there are nodding, going, yes, I focus on the nose, Mike. I try to focus on the eyes, but the, I'm on 1.2, and I caught the nose. But with the eye detection, it's like the cheat code. So I want, I just kind of crowbarring this in a little bit, but <laughs> this is the 85 millimeter 1.4 DGDN. This is a brand new lens this year. And this is shot, this came from Sigma Japan as different people from around the world that photographed portraiture using this lens. And I just can't recommend this enough as a new uh, mirrorless user. It's a smaller lens. It's 1.4, it's designed for mirrorless. A lot of our lenses in the past, people would say, oh, they're a little bit big. That's changed a lot now. And walk, I used to say walking around with a 35 millimeter is great, mainly because it was smaller and more compact. Now you can walk around with an 85 millimeter and it will inspire you to take portraits because it's a little bit easier to walk around with. Um, and definitely check that out. We already know 11 bladed aperture, if you've been asking, rounded blades, you know those rounded blades make uh, those circles look a lot nicer. You don't want those octagon circles, the bokeh circles. You want the real beautiful round circles like cinema. 15 elements, 11 groups. Okay, I don't want you guys to go to sleep on this part. All right, so any questions out there? Any que I'm sure you guys are answering them in the chat. You know, yeah, feel free. we are. Um, I think, curious, what camera are you primarily using for the shots that you're sharing or a couple of cameras maybe? Yeah, a lot of this was with the Canon 5D Mark III at the time, which now feels so heavy <laughs> by comparison. <Right? laughs> uh, the the one I like now is lately the, the Sony 7Rs are very nice, uh, and I shoot the FP. We have a new FPL camera as well. It's right. mirrorless as L mount, and I, I like the Sony stuff. Anything. Anything mirrorless is just great in general because it's smaller. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, so all this could be done with that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of what I did with these with. Again, still okay. the 35 millimeter. This was a an interesting project too. The lighting wasn't great, but the idea, this was called uh, Yo Base Camp. It was Chris Sharma has a, a fund. They take people out to, uh, I think this is in Sierra Mountains and it, this was all kids from Palo Alto that really hadn't gone rock climbing. And the programs, it, the idea is to inspire kids that, to get out into nature and to accomplish their goals. 
through rock climbing and watching these kids in the beginning of the day, they were a little bit worried about it, but I knew that as they were finding more joy with it to kind of hang around. And I, I wanted something that would really tell the story. And to me, this really told the story. And I think I bounced a flash off, off of something because it was just noon, the harshest light, but you know, you have to try to get something out of it. So the idea for me was how do I show, you know, kids enjoying nature and growing and learning and, and getting something out of it. And the photo essay aspect is, oh, that's, these are all the, put yourself in the person, the young person's shoes of tying the first knot for climbing, learning that. And you kind of get a sense of just motion and, and being there with these little details. And this is some of the staff that were just getting kids, just get out of their head and just jump and laugh and tell funny stories. And the top right, you can see this girl just coming down from a climb. She achieved something. And then uh, bottom left, you can see this, that the environment there in the Sierra Mountains is just so surreal and unique. So you combine all those things together, you have a, a, a beautiful learning experience for sure. Something they all came, came back with feeling good. This is a 12 to 24. And I wanted to show this. We sometimes will show this with how a a lens can change a portrait change someone's face in portraiture so if you start with a 14 millimeter photograph someone and go to a 50 and then go to 135 their face actually looks different here we did it with a rock so this is at 18 millimeters and you can see this first one and then the next one same rock is 35 millimeter so we go from 18 35 in the same position and all the way up to the 120 to 300 at 153. So the takeaway from that is when you're shooting super wide, there might there there might be a good reason for it. With this one, the idea was the client wanted to show that it was for a clothing company. They wanted to show that there is a winter coming or it's fall. There's usually a, a year a year ahead that they're designing uh, catalogs for that. So you wanted to find a place in California that had some snow on it. So you can try to, we found a little bit of snow in the background here. And then I'm trying to keep the snow in, but now if you, the longer the lens here at 35, the, the more compressed the background is. So when you get, get to something like 153 millimeters, you start to see that background really come close to the foreground. So it indicates, you know, where I'm at. Oh, and that might not have been the best choice. Probably the, a better choice would be the second one because you get an idea. Okay, it's this rock climber and, and it's it getting kind of wintry. So that's what the benefit of a zoom and telephoto lens is. It's making it compressing things. It's versatile. It's great for portraiture and it, it emphasizes a blurred background because it is such a long lens. So a lot of times you'll see people say, I, I don't really want to do an 85 millimeter. I'll do a 70 to 200 because it has an 85 millimeter in there and it's more versatile. Uh, the only downside of that is shooting an 85 on a 70 to 200 is you don't have the 1.4 effect and you're not going to be as tack sharp on a zoom lens as you would be on a prime lens. So, but for me, a 70 to 200 is necessary at times and zoom lenses have a place. Sometimes you cannot be very close to the action. So here uh, with skateboarding, trying to capture different shapes and angles uh, and looking at some skate photography, uh, if you ever get a chance to look online, some of the best photography comes out of skateboarding. Uh, these are not the best examples, but there's so many, so much creative photography comes out of that, that culture for sure. And the 7200, here, uh, trying to shoot an engagement photo. Again, a lot of times I'm doing these for a friend. I'm not sure what to do with an engagement photo. So ask questions. What do you want? What would you, what would make you happy at the end of this, uh, as an engagement photo, this girl had an idea already. And for me, perfect. And of course the dog is looking right at us with, uh, sorry about all the sounds here in the background, the, uh, with the, with lifestyle photography is a little bit like editorial photography, but usually it's trying to sell something. A lot of times you, you can remember things like a J crew catalog or people pointing and it's a fine line of looking too 
it can get, look a little too staged and hokey versus something that looks a little more natural. For this, we were shooting portraits of her and we capitalized on a, uh, a great background, which was this wall, banana wallpaper. I don't know what's going on with my computer. I apologize. Some of the people, very important, probably spam emails. Um, blowing up. <laughs> blowing up, man. It's Friday. I don't know. People, it is, people yeah. Ask for stuff. <laughs> uh, this is the 100 to 400. And what's great about some of our, our long lenses is that you have a focus limiter. So on the 100 to 400, you can fo limit focus. And I've even seen people shoot through, shoot baseball right through the tiny gate, limit the focus so they won't get that gate and just focus on the pitcher. Here I'm trying to, I would shoot a lot of my son playing soccer. He kind of went demon mode on this photo, but uh, I was, I, I thought I'm only shooting from the side, but I wanted to shoot through the goal and see him trying to get something. It was a little bit tricky, but I wanted to see some of the goal. But that's what's great about it. If you don't have a focus limiter on a lens, you'll start to focus the entire barrel. You'll search the whole thing. So it would easily catch this, this net in the foreground had I not, had, if I was just on autofocus. So I can be past the net searching for the player. I hope that makes sense. If not, definitely Aaron will be answering that in the chat and, and speak it, say it much better than I just did. Uh, the 100 to 400 too, if you, it's, we have a DGDN one now for mirrorless. So this is a great lens. If you don't want, if you go somewhere, you don't want to carry a 150 to 600, but you want to walk around with a long lens, it's going to get action on, shoot surfing, shoot birds. 100 to 400 is the lens. Same with the soccer, same with air shows. It's just the perfect length to carry around. It almost packs like a 70 to 200 in your camera bag. So again, I, on this, try to play with some of the foreground being out of focus as well as the background. So like with these little birds, a good way to do that, I don't know if I'm illustrating it the best here, but it's thinking about things as silhouettes. You see that a lot on Instagram as well. Like you see a guy on a mountain, you know, and he, there's a stars, and, you know, it's because you can easily make that out. So when you squint at stuff, like, can I see the birds that they're birds? If I get a little lower, maybe I can see their legs better. So little things like that, how you can silhouette things. As I said earlier, the great lens for an air show, I went to my first air show and I thought everything was going to be really far away. And no, a lot of times I was shooting at 100 uh, millimeters. So great lens for that. And again, if shooting the planes is one thing, but you can create that photo essay out of the, the support images and looking for even graphic things like this. Uh, and as I was shooting that, I was like, oh, I have a little photo series of all these little crazy smokes. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you call smokes. That's the, first of all, it's not a word smokes. I don't think it, maybe it is, but all these little uh, colored smoke that they do out of these things uh, from, I think it's Red Bull. Some of them were just giant clouds of black smoke, and, but very kind of a, a surreal little thing. Wide angle lenses. We have the fastest 1.8, 14 millimeter wide angle. And if anybody out there shoots night sky photography, this is the best lens for it because there's no other 14 millimeter 1.8 full frame out there. And it's just corner to corner shop sharp. If you're looking to shoot real estate, is a good choice, but you might want to go with 14 to 24. You have a little more versatility and that's 2.8. So if you really need the low light factor in the wide, fast aperture, the 14 millimeter 1.8 is a great choice. Here you can, and you'll find that you are very close to the objects when you're shooting a 14 millimeter or any wide angle lens. And that is probably the best way to shoot a wide angle lens to get the most out of it is come crazy close to something and try to balance out the composition once you're really close. Uh, here I'm about two feet from, from the skateboarder. This is same 14 millimeter lens. I was trying to shoot that eclipse. You remember when that, I, I know up in the Northwest, you guys got to see like the best version of that eclipse back in, I mean, it was that like last year. Well, I went, I was in Vegas where there's no clouds usually. And then today, on that day, there was a big cloud, nothing worked out. In my head, I thought, oh, I'm going to shoot that, that Ferris wheel 
and there's going to be an eclipse through it, and you know, and none of that happened. So, and in hindsight, I don't think the 14 would have worked out. I think a longer lens might have made it work. But again, you go out and there's a bunch of clouds. So, all you could do is try. I like shooting the wide-angle lens too because it shows things as for how vast they are. Here in the Southwest, we're always driving through all these you know, open deserts and this is in Utah, I just pulled off the road and you see all these clouds. And anytime I see clouds, I don't know about anyone else out there, but you instantly want to photograph clouds. It makes a scene look so much better, whether it's a portrait or just a landscape, a big storm clouds. I envy places that just have these giant clouds that they, they get to work with. Same with the trying different angles, you know, laying it down, trying to shoot different effects, trying to tell a story from a different way. And this kind of, this concludes it, but I really, I, and I'm kind of using this top image here just to really put it out there that jumping around a little bit in this, how to do a photo essay or, or whatever it is you might want to shoot and ways you can approach it. But the, the root of it is, is what is it that you find interesting and who is it that you find interesting? And how can you use your talents to help to communicate what you think about them or help communicate that story? Maybe it's a, 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 a relative, it's a veteran or anything. Uh, maybe it's a giant subject that you have a, have a ecological cause or there's so many different things, but I hope you might think about some of those ideas and assign yourself a photo essay. And with that, I will say thank you and Try to check All us right. out on Sigma Photo, at Sigma Photo on any of the social media. Yeah, and we do have a couple of questions. And um, I know for me, I, as a, I'm as primarily a portrait photographer, but I do a fair bit of travel. And that's where I really feel like the photo essays kind of come into play is like, how can I put a little photo essay together of my experience in that place or with the people that I met along the way? Um, but I think a lot of brands use photo essays to tell their story for social media, too. So there's so many implications and uses, for sure. Um, I do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, we've had a very chatty chat room, uh, so hopefully I haven't missed too many. But for those of you tuning in, we have a few more minutes. So if you have questions, go ahead and get those posted in the chat. I know Aaron and I have been in there answering some gear-specific questions. But I'd love to ask you a couple of these more um, theory kind of questions. So um, Nate Love is asking, do you kind of work a scene by starting wide and then get into the details? Um, kind of like what's your flow and approach? Because I know you talked about kind of doing like that hero shot or the connected portrait maybe at the end after things are looser. Um, but kind of what's your approach to getting started? Yeah, that's a really good question. I wish I did have more of an approach. I think my approach would be more of trying to have some idea of what I hope kind of will happen, which means a diversity of images. But um, I don't. I would probably, if it's with people, if it's with place, more place oriented. I I agree. I, I would start wide and stay wide until I feel like I have something that communicated that with. When it's more people oriented, I really um, I judge on the person and how how comfortable they are. If, if they're kind of like there's a part of you almost has to click off and go, all right, I need to quit thinking too far ahead of how this is all going to turn out. Trust me, guy, hurry up, get over here and and get too out of it and not keep them feeling good. So I'd say I'd really base it on the subject. If the subject feels a little shy or if the subject is all ham about it, then I might just go, hey, I'm gonna put a wide angle lens in your face because you're obviously really into this. Or if yeah. someone's a little, I don't, you know, I'm gonna back up. Even though I'm zoomed in with a 70 to 200 and I'm getting a tight shot, they're now suddenly very comfortable. Because you're you know, a little but, further away. But I, as you go, no matter how, which, place, which pieces of the puzzle you put together, just try to remember, oh, did I only get stuck doing this? Or did I, should I, when I get to the editing room, am I gonna see 500 pictures that are the same and only a four, to five, four to five different ones over here? Cause I get stuck, you get stuck in a lane. So I'd say right. 
know when to quit if it's not working too, you know, like jump to something else. Well, let me ask you this. So um, with the people that you're working with, do you kind of, I know for me, um, I'll sit down with a client or a subject and kind of get to know them a little bit and kind of suss out what they're interested in, what they, what their needs are. Um, because a lot of times this is work we're creating for them to use, um, but potentially also portfolio pieces for us. Um, do you do, do you have those kinds of conversations before you go into the actual session itself? Um, any kind of like pre-planning, pre-production kind of stuff? I should, but my personality doesn't, doesn't really do it that way. I I feel like, uh, for me, I, I let them feel comfortable. Like, look, I'm going to stumble through this too. And I want you to look the best. And I, as you, as I'm going to ask questions and have them tell me as I have the camera in my hand, as I'm shooting. So sometimes it's almost like it's their first reference of it. Like, Mm -hmm. but I'm specifically talking about people that are more crafts oriented, like musicians Uh, with someone that's, you know, more portraiture. I could see that probably making the most sense. Um, You know, it's hard. It's it's, it's just two different worlds when you're the editorial side for me feels much easier because you can use the environment to help tell a story and you can use the action to help tell the story. Portraiture itself, I still struggle with, and um, even I just tried to do it recently uh, after being rusty for this last year, try to photograph yeah. a person in that way. I I just was dropping the ball so much. I just, uh, also it's how, you you know, it's how uh, if you're rusty, you, your game is off. So I feel like I, I've been a little rusty on that. I don't know about you. if you. Has ever, ever been out, out there been shooting a lot of people or have they been a little distance from people in the last I've year? Been, I mean, I my sessions picked up towards the end of the year last year. So I'm, I've am i been not busy, busy, but things have been picking up. And um, I, I guess I felt a little bit rusty with that first couple of sessions too. But um, I always kind of have that pre-production call or meeting with a client before we get into it just to make sure that you know, I'm going to get everything they need, but it also gives me an opportunity to get to know them a little bit so that I have more to work with in the actual session to help put them at ease, especially if they're not comfortable. So that's kind of like my approach in that yeah. way. Let me get this I one like, last question. Go ahead. I just want to say one more thing on that. I think one of the questions I've asked once that was helpful was say it was something I didn't have connection to the person. I didn't really know what was going to happen. I like to ask, like, say as a wedding or something, it was what is it that you would want at the end of this yeah. that would make it feel like you got what you wanted? Like, cause maybe yeah. I'm trying to get all these photojournalistic things, but they really wanted this really formal thing. And I didn't ask that question and then they right. get it and they, they're seeing my vision. So that, that's a good point to asking those questions and, and seeing what would make them happy at the end. And then you go, yeah. I gotta get that shot. I gotta get that shot. Exactly. That's gonna get for sure done. And I'm even writing that down. Yeah. No, I, I'm I'm also like the the planner person, so my approach is a little bit different because I have more of a background in commercial photography and a little less in the editorial. Let's get this uh, one last question in from Jim, who is a regular on our events, um, and he's kind of ask us asking, "What are good practices for presenting these stories? Um, do you typically do this in a short series of images, like?" two to three images or four images, like some of your slides had several images grouped. Um, how are you presenting those typically? Um, or are you just kind of delivering images to clients and, and they handle that presentation aspect? Yeah, if, um, if it was, I'll kind of plug to, for me as personal, like any of the, some of the older images I was showing you up front, I recently been posting them to, uh, Adobe has a site called Behance. It's, you know, it allows people yeah. to just put a catalog of stuff and it will even populate slides, um, a website. So I like that because I can kind of see it and yeah. in a one visual, you know, I could share it and easily uh, send this digital version. And the second way, and I'll, and I'll, I'll show like 30, 20 or 30 because it's scrolling, but I like something that you can see them all together. It's not as great when you're having to scroll one by one because you're judging right. them individually. And the second part of that is just, I'm going back to making uh, photo zines and stuff because yeah. it's something nice that you can uh, thumb through 
and it's very like topic oriented. So I can't like vortex on all these different things. I can be like, oh, this is just going to be this. And well, this is all I shot that already happened. Or this is all I, you know, if it's ongoing, you can kind of keep your head on straight. I don't know. I get a little scattered, but those are two <laughs> good ways sharing. Cool. The, uh, I like that. Zines have been on my mind lately as well. Um, I have some concepts for some, but I gotta, I gotta get it done. Are you doing any fine. digital zines or are you actually doing printed zines? Uh, printed and well, the digital, I haven't, I haven't done the digital, but what, what helps me is by posting the photos, sometimes it's just getting, this is some of the, some people will connect with this. Sometimes you can keep stuff for so long. Some of the photos I showed are like 20 years old and then I put them out there. And then just by putting them into a web page that you can scroll through and go, you know, I'm going to, darn it, I'm going to share these with other people in the world, you know, right. and a lot of us get caught up and like, oh, it's, it's not, you know, so when I do that part and then maybe you get some good feedback, maybe you show 10 in Instagram or something, then you kind of gets you psyched to go, okay, I'm feel confident enough in these to share them. Yeah. Therefore it almost sets, the, it works backwards. It almost works. And then you do the scene because you've already in a way edited them to what you would show the public if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. We, we lost your audio there for just a second. And so okay. now uh, I've got Jim and a couple other folks saying, let's do workshops on zines. And I'm like, totally in on that. So um, with that said, um, I want to, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Mike, I want to thank you so much for all of that information and inspiration to get us thinking beyond the technical a little bit and start thinking about building those stories and sharing those stories. Um, there's so many great opportunities to do that in the world today. Um, and this just was great and inspirational for that. So Mike, thank you so much for your time. And Aaron, you rock star helping out with uh, the YouTube chatter. Um, I, think, I think that's the most chatter we've had in a chat room um, in quite some time. So thanks for all of that. Yeah. And to everyone who tuned in, thank you for joining us today. And just a reminder, uh, check out other upcoming events on our website, um, including PhotoFest. You don't want to miss it. It's our biggest sale of the year. So there'll be special promotions in store and online. Um, and of course, some awesome programming and at least one and maybe two or three photo walks. So check that out, glazerscamera.com. Go to the events page for details there. And um, everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you online next week for our next presentation. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks. Bye.